Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to get into this panel about indie film distribution. Um, we've got some amazing panelists with us today. We've got Yelena Grozdenich from Columbia Records. <laughs> yes. We've got Robert Fivolent, who is a producer and entertainment attorney. And then, of course, you all know him, you love him, Jonathan McHugh, who is one of the founding members of the Guild and here with us today. He music supervises and produces as well. On the end, Jonathan, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today? Tell us about your projects, what you're up to. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we started the Guild, I don't know, a dozen years or so ago. And uh, around that time, I started, uh, about probably about like 15, 20 years ago, I produced my first film when I was at Jive Records. And we, uh, the idea of finding opportunities to create uh, visual content with your artists. And obviously, we had an artist at Jive Records named Britney Spears. It was actually 2001, 20 years ago. And I uh, produced my first movie called Crossroads with Viacom and uh, MTV Films. So from that moment on, I was always kind of uh, interested in figuring out ways to create visual content. Uh, I later wrote a movie for Snoop Dogg, which we made and Lionsgate bought uh, while I was work working at Jive Records. After I left Jive Records, I went to Def Jam. One of my first weeks on the job, my boss asked me to go see this kid who was playing in the mall. And I figured he was playing in, a, in the store, but when I got to Universal City Walk, there were 5,000 preteen girls buzzing as Justin Bieber was about to take the stage. And it was an amazing thing to me because I had never heard of him because he had just come off the internet and got signed right away. Scooter had brought him to Usher. Usher brought him to L.A. Reid. And he was an instant phenomenon. Uh, it was at that moment I realized like I had to figure out how to make a movie with this guy. And cut to a year later, I went to have lunch with Randy Spendlove at Paramount Pictures as Bieber was doing his first tour, Bieber Mania. And Randy and I cooked up an idea to do like a $3 million straight to video uh, documentary. Um, by the time CAA and Scooter and we all got changed to up the game as Bieber's star continued to rise, we made an $11 million 3D popumentary shot at Madison Square Garden directed by John Chu who went directly from that movie to do G.I. Joe, which was a $125 million movie, and then he created a series called Crazy Rich Asians. So John Chu had a good little bounce off the Bieber movie, which, by the way, is the second highest grossing music documentary of all time behind Michael Jackson. So the power of that visual content for me um, was, you know, was amazing. And one of the interesting stories on that film was in talking about clearing music rights, you know, Justin had, Justin had two huge hits at that point, and Paramount wanted to use those songs in the trailer, but um, we also had to clear all the other songs in the movie. And so I came up with the idea that I needed MFN, right, Most Favorite Nations, on all songs in the movie, because every other publisher wanted the same as the hits, even though they weren't really justified. So I made a side deal with Paramount Pictures and the rights holders of those two songs that I would get them trailer placement and I would get them at least another $50,000 per side on top of licensing fee if they played ball with me at a very ridiculously low licensing fee. And film studios are never really gonna commit to marketing in advance, but they realized that this was the opportunity. They knew they wanted the hit songs in the trailer so it was a question of they had to commit in advance, and we did that. And I was able to keep MFN across the board and get all songs in the movie reasonably priced. So as this game goes, same thing with Janis Joplin. I was able to get, I produced a Janis Joplin film, and I was able to get a great Academy Award uh, nominated director, introduce her to Sony Records. Sony Records comes in with uh, Adam Block and Legacy at the time, gives us $100,000 to start the process. We make a sizzle reel. But by getting... Sony involved and getting an incredibly low master fee, I'm able to beat back the publishers that really have been waiting 20 years for a Janis Joplin film and want a lot more money. So to have that MFN established by one of the parties is really key to be able to um, get these movies made. So I'll shut up now and let, let's roll around the room a little bit. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for that. I'm excited to uh, get more into that. But Robert, do you want to tell us a little bit about your evolution? Sure. 
So uh, I moved to Los Angeles to finish law school and uh, got my first job working for the theme park division of uh, the Walt Disney Company and uh, got into licensing day one, uh, doing things for the theme parks, you know, working on, I licensed the rights for, for Twilight Zone, Tower of Terror, um, you know, those types of things. Uh, music too. It's no, it's long past its days as the Twilight Zone, Tower of Terror. But, um, but I went on to, uh, to work for Sony Pictures. I was at, uh, started out as the home video department at Sony and became Screen Gems. And uh, I was in legal affairs there. And part of my job there was acquiring rights to um, uh, independently produce films. So we were buying a lot of films. We started making films. So I became very well versed in the world of independent film financing, both in terms of um, buying films and sort of taking a look at the structures of how those uh, films were being put together, but also um, the studio itself um, sort of acted like its own independent film production entity. And so we were getting creative and finding financing for films, even though it was sort of in the studio system. Um, then I left there. I uh, was head of business and legal affairs for an entertainment uh, independent distributor and producer called New Market Films. Um, we produced Chris Nolan's first big movie, Memento. Um, we distributed just a wide variety of, um, you know, what I would call art house, but commercial art house films, Donnie Darko, Whale Rider, Monster. We distributed Passion of the Christ for Mel Gibson, uh, which was an adventure. Um, we uh, uh, sort of, you know, created a, a, a niche for ourselves as a, a, um, a real independent label. And uh, when that company sold, I, um, I went out on my own and uh, kind of freed me up to be able to work on my own projects. Um, I've been a writer. I, um, as you can see from the trailer, I, I produced Summer of Soul this year, which was a great year. <laughs> um, did, did pretty well with that. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, I've, you know, I've kind of worked on both sides. I've, you know, worked uh, from, you know, my own projects as an independent uh, producer and writer, and I've, you know, worked as a buyer on the on the studio side, so. Very cool. Yelena. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yelena Grostinich. I, I currently work at Columbia Records, and I'm one of the few people who's been at the same job since I've graduated college. Um, so I started at Sony Music when we used to have a licensing team that was all under one name called Sync Shop. And so I got my start licensing music to independent films and when you start usually at a label that's kind of like the low-level job that you do, it's like, oh, you just license songs for film festivals. And then over the last decade, I would say, is these films become some of the biggest, most important films of our time because people want to consume real stories that are made by real people and not just big studios making another big Marvel film, which there is nothing wrong with. But, you know, I think there's something so special, and I just have developed such a passion for licensing music to independent films and being on the label side of things, my job is to protect the artists and to protect their art to, and, you know, and licensing music to these projects. But, you know, I say protect because, you know, I, I have such a strong feeling towards artistry, but at the same time, we want their music in picture as we all are here to do. So that's just a little bit about me. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I'm excited to get into these discussions. We were already getting into it quite a bit in the green room, and I was desperately trying to hold them off to do it for real here. Um, but I know it's going to be a great conversation. So I was wondering if Robert and Jonathan, you could kind of give us a little bit of an introduction background on you know, the life cycle of what an independently funded film looks like from inception to release. And, and, and then beyond that, kind of what the payout looks like when people start, do people start Never. making money? <laughs> if there is money to be made, where does it go? Rob, you want to start? Sure. So, you know, there's no one way to finance a film, I'm sure everyone knows and you know there's certainly a more common model in the independent world right now to take your project and package it and take it to a streamer and they're going to give you just enough money to make it and make minimum wages your producer fees so i mean you know from my perspective 
you know, being facetious, I mean, there's obviously times that it makes sense to 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 partner with um, with a studio or a or a, a streamer. But you know, the way I have enjoyed working is raising independent film financing. Not easily done, but if you do do it, you have a couple things going for you, right? You have uh, you don't have a studio looking over your shoulder creatively. Um, and you also have the advantage that if you make a good movie and you take it to the market, you can have some say in the, how the distribution happens. So with Summer of Soul, you know, we were approached by, you know, quite a few of the studios and streamers, but really went with Disney because they were willing to commit to both a theatrical release during COVID, which was incredible, and, you know, had a separate... Um, were, they were willing to open their distribution platforms to the film. So not only did it play on um, Hulu, but they even broadcast it, you know, on a Sunday night on ABC. So, you know, we couldn't have asked for, for, for better distribution on, on, on that front. But, you know, in terms of how the sort of financing works on an in independent film, I mean, um, you know, I can kind of talk broad strokes. You know, it's, you know, could, could we're we're a room yeah. full of music people. Yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, for, the film for the most part, you know, you're raising the money. You're promising the the investors uh, their money back. Um, and when I say promise, you're promising them the opportunity to make their money back. You're not guaranteeing that they will, um, but you're offering the opportunity for them to make their money back plus. Uh, what's called a return on investment. So, uh, you know, 15 or 20% on top of their money. Um, and I know you had asked me a little bit about accounting waterfalls. And so in the independent film space, how that works is, you know, an investment agreement will lay out when money comes in the door, how is it proportioned among um, both the investors and people who had a participation in it. So if there's talent that has a piece or a director has a piece, that waterfall dictates how that works. But typically there's some off the tops. You know, if you look at, if you think of it as a waterfall, I mean, that is why they call it that. If you think of it at, at the top of that waterfall, there's going to be certain expenses that come right off the top, your sales agent fee, because you're going to probably have a sales agent that's going to go out and sell the film. And that sales agent's not going to be willing to wait you know, behind your investors. They want to know that whatever sale is made, they're getting their piece of that right off the top. And then there can be times when there's either deferments, you know, people who were promised money that weren't paid out of the budget and you have to go back and pay them. And the investors accepted that that was going to be the case. And there are times that you have music in there too. If the investors know that the music was not covered. When you say you have to go back and pay them, who is the you that's responsible for that? The producers. Well, I mean, put it this way. I mean, it doesn't just happen um, after the fact. When you go and raise that money, you are saying to your investors, there's a waterfall in their agreement too. So their agreement's going to say, here's what's going to happen when money comes in the door. You get this. And that agreement, a lot of investor agreements might say, you can't even make, I mean, well, I know we're going to get into it. You can't even make step deals. You have to have all the music 100% licensed. You can't you can't even make this film unless your budget has enough to pay for all the music in it. Um, but there are times that the investors know realistically, you don't know what songs are going to be in something and there's a little bit of leeway and they know that you're going to go make deals that may have to offer the publishers a piece, you know, down the line. And so, you know, a good lawyer, um, should, <laughs> should, should build into that waterfall, a place at the top where those, you know, that money's going to go before the investors get their money back. And it shouldn't be a surprise to investors because when they entered into that investment agreement, they knew that this is before we get our money and our return on our investment, we're going to see, you know, uh, those other uh, expenses, whatever they are. I mean, there could be other expenses that come off the top too, like uh, festival expenses, marketing expenses, things you may want to not have covered in your budget, but which are going to be necessary for you to sell the film. And so hopefully you've drafted your agreement in a way that, you know, the investors know that that's going to come out of that waterfall too. Um, you know, and from then on, you know, everything's a negotiation after the investors, you know, some money's going to go to a pool of 
that's set aside for the investors. Another pool is going to be for whoever is participating in the profit. So the producers themselves, talent, director, sometimes the production services company, they all share out of a separate pool. So, and this is this is the classic structure. I mean, you know, there's a gazillion variations on this probably. And like I said, everything's a negotiation. But that's sort of what the general waterfall in a basic independently filmed finance deal looks like. Hey, Rob, um, if you wouldn't mind, just because the story is so good of the history of this film, Summer of Soul, and what it really takes to be a producer, if you wouldn't mind just tracking back, you know, how you got those rights and then the process of those different many years of getting, uh, keeping those rights, uh, including sure. when it came down to the wire, when you actually got your director and some money. And then also, and you don't need to name check who got the money, but like first chunks that came in to, to build this momentum for you, because it's really a fantastic story, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Sure. I mean, um, I mean, I would say just as a snapshot, I mean, Summer of Soul did fit into that model I just described. So the waterfall was very much, you know, that structure. We raised, um, you know, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, he was not unaware that it was valuable. Um, you know, he knew that he had tried many times over the years to, to, to do something with it. Um, but anyway, I got involved with it and I, you know, I convinced him, even though I didn't have any producing credits, so I, you know, convinced him we would make a great movie out of it. And, uh, we, um, you know, we had it set up a couple of times and thank God it didn't happen until this last version because it was the best version, I think, you know, in the right timing for the movie. But, um, you know, to John's point, um, it was in terms of raising the money, um, you know, we literally had to go out and went to independent um, financiers and we had a whole package at that point put together. I mean, we had approached Questlove, who we thought was the right kind of storyteller for this movie, even though he had never directed. But, um, you know, we assured our investors that we were going to surround him with a good team and, and uh you know, really um, shepherd the project from start to finish. And, you know, you know, I don't know how many of you will be in the process of raising money for a movie, but, you know, I can tell you that there's a little bit of a domino effect. It's, you know, everyone in Hollywood doesn't want to jump in until somebody else jumps in. And so, you know, that was the case in, in, with this film is once we got one fairly significant investor, the, the other ones came together pretty quickly. And, um, we made the film and, you know, during COVID, we weren't sure, you know, if we were even going to be able to shop it. Um, you know, I've been going to film festivals for, you know, my whole career and, you know, there was no film festival to go to. We, we, we got accepted to Sundance. They told us two weeks before Sundance started that it was just going to be a virtual festival. We said, okay, uh, they put it out there and, you know, I think it worked to our advantage because I think more people got it than, got to see it than might have been in Park City. Um, and, uh, you know, the reviews were good and, and uh, started piling up some awards and, you know, came down to walking on stage right after Chris Rock got slapped. So, <laughs> uh, Lifetime memories there, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine if you had made that film five years ago, ten years ago? You never would have been, been the same part thing. Of, <laughs> you never would have gotten to see Will Smith. Um, so, Jonathan, can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll touch base about Cosplay Universe because it's not as long a story, but it's half as long. Um, that film started out as a film about the history of cosplay, and then I was just producing it, and then the director, one of the co-directors, got a, his narrative feature, his first narrative feature, and he, and he wanted to go do that. And so I was already involved as a producer, so I just kind of stepped in and helped out the cinematographer who was left by himself to try to direct it. And we continued the battle for the last the next five years of making this film um, and talk about a journey like Rob's. You know, we had a situation where literally five years ago, we had an offer from Netflix through an aggregator um, to put the film on Netflix. And I was like, wow, my first film I direct going on Netflix. Amazing. So as it comes down to the aggregator about to give us our, our second, what's called MG, which is called minimum guarantee uh, for uh, an advance against uh, royalties. I find out that that aggregator is going bankrupt. He doesn't tell me, but I find out from his accounting department randomly because I happen to have coffee with them. 
and I get this inside skinny that he's going down. And not only that, the money that he promised me and my investors had been Ponzi to somebody else. So now you're in this terrible Sophie's Choice situation where you could have your first film on Netflix, but you could be liable to your investors because the money that you told them is coming is not coming. So you could be sued. And my partners and I decided that we would have to pass on the Netflix deal. And, at the, and again, what was Rob saying, this wasn't a great version of the film. Um, we'd showed two scenes to Netflix and a trailer, our best two scenes in a trailer. Um, but the rest of the film needed a lot of work and time. So we literally had to pass on the Netflix deal. We found an international distributor. Uh, they took the film out to certain territories as they were starting to go deeper. COVID hit uh, in March uh, 2020. And then they went bankrupt immediately, almost immediately, because they, they were over leveraged. So now you have first bankruptcy, second bankruptcy, and you have COVID, right? So we had raised a number of different dollars throughout the years to keep it going. Um, a Japanese investor came in. Uh, who basically sent us to Japan to shoot this World Cosplay Summit, which you see in the, in the um, trailer. And that made it, opened up the scope and made it more an international film. And um, so cut to present day, we do a small theatrical this summer, get some really good um, re reactions from people, but not a lot. We play in France, we play in Germany, we play in America, a couple other territories. And now we were told on September 20th that the film is coming out on, uh, on, you know, like iTunes and Vudu and all these different things and Amazon. So 920 shows up, no Amazon. And a bunch of different people who, uh, a bunch of different iTunes had a misspelling. Vudu put up a wrong picture. Another one put up um, a, literally a different, a, a, different, a different description of a different movie. Like, so it's like, wait, how can this happen? And then Amazon literally went up today. So the movie, movie's out today in, on, on the Amazon universe. And it just goes to show you that, you know, you just never know. And like Rob's story and my story on these films, you say to yourself when it's happening, like, why are we doing this? Like, why do we love this so much that we're not going to make any money? In Rob's case, it happened to be, to me, the documentary lottery of the decade because the amount of support he got from these different players coming together between um, Hulu, ABC, Disney, Fox Search, like with their incredible marketing. Um, so it, it, for every one of my stories that don't work out as well, there's Rob's story that people keep coming back. It's like golf, you know, you can be terrible at the game and then you make that one shot and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna keep coming back at this game. So um, that's my twisted story on this one. Great. But it's Thank good, you. Movie, so go check it out. Um, so, Yelena, can you tell us a little bit about from the label perspective? Because as we all know, um, you know, indie films have really seen a big shift with streamers becoming such a prominent player. And so a lot of people used to explore step deals as an option to kind of keep the budget manageable for independently funded projects and then if there was success then understandably the artists would make more as a result of that but we see well actually we don't see any information from Netflix and Hulu and stuff on on who who's watching how many people are watching and so what has that been like to see that change from the label side tough <laughs> um no I mean because you know, before we're all familiar, we would do, you know, box box office step deals and we're like, you know, there's full transparency there. But as we know, and as we talked about a little bit, there's just such a lack of transparency nowadays with what finances are getting and how much films are making and things like that. So when it comes to making step deals, we're trying to figure out, well, how do we do this? Because, you know, step deals are a thing where we do want these artists to benefit on the back end if there is success in the film. But how do we do that in this day and age? And so some of the you know ways that we've been trying to get creative, we're like, well, maybe we do step deals based on if it gets picked up by an SVOD, if it goes on broadcasts, if it goes you know to home video, or you know, or we're trying to figure out, do we just do strong MFN deals up front, and we just are like, let's maximize these upfront fees and just say like, this is what the budget of the film is, so these are the comparable fees. And so there really is no right answer. We've been trying to figure it out day by day, and. If we have some good partners on the other side who are willing to get creative with us and 
Because at the end of the day, we all are just supporting artistry and creatives, and we just want to maximize everybody. We want everybody to win financially somehow. So we're just trying to figure out what to do. There is no real answer yet, but I think the key is going to figure out how to make deals more transparent. And I think that comes from those Netflixes, Amazon, and Hulus giving a little more transparency to their own producers and filmmakers to say, this is how your film is doing. And so then that information can trickle back to the rights holders and just trying to figure out what makes sense for everyone. I'm sure you can say something about that, of the lack of transparency. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things we were talking about in the green room was that from my perspective, and I know I'm speaking to music supervisors, the worst music supervisor in many cases is what I would say a great DJ. Because it's one thing to have a skill to know great music, to find that cool indie song that you can get for no money and put it in a show or whatever. But for most independent films, you need somebody that, yes, they have that skill set or they can be there to help you find cool music. But you really need somebody that understands the economics of the film you're making and what you're going to be faced with in the marketplace because, you know, you can just end up in a situation where, you know, your your music can literally prevent your film from getting distribution. And Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I got involved with a movie and, I, you know, it's it's still a work in progress to some extent, but I, you know, I got involved after the film was already... Um, almost three quarters of the way done, but it has amazing musical artists in it and um, amazing performances that were done, you know, by the uh, artists for the film. But the, the music had to be licensed. And, you know, the, the music publishers, from my perspective, I mean, one of the issues that I have is that a lot of the music publishers are not looking at the difference between putting a song in a hit you know, HBO show and putting it in a documentary that is literally music about the subject, you know, the subject that's the people that are playing it or whatever, where you're promoting the catalog of that person or you're promoting their career. Now, I'm not saying they should give it to you for free because I think in, even in the documentary space, the lines between entertainment and documentary are now almost completely that was an earlier panel. We missed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, it's not an uncommon topic right now. So, you know, I understand that, you know, the, the publishers are gonna, aren't going to say, oh, you're going to, you're going to, our, our, you know, your, our artist is going to do great on title because you put it in. No, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to do that. But I do think they should look at the difference between a needle drop that's just using music for a cool scene and music that in some you know, to some extent, is elevating the career and the catalog of the artists involved. And I, I don't find that that happens a lot on the publishing side. Well, then you got to hire some better people over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, can I play devil's advocate <laughs> for a second? Because, you know, I, I would... I would think that from the publishing side, they would look at that and say, well, your entire project hinges on our song rights. So you should obviously pay a lot of money because... That's what your whole project is based around. No, I mean, that is the, that, you know, that's why they call it a negotiation. I get that. You know, that's why I said I don't think they should do it for free. But, you know, I've also used the, the analogy of, you know, walking through a casino in Vegas and seeing, you know, hearing everyone screaming and saying, look, everyone's winning. You know, no, 99% of the people in there are losing. And the publishers have to understand that for, you know, you know, listen to, to you know, John's situation. There are successes and there are home runs. But, you know, if you base your economics on the home runs, you're going to price a lot of people out of the market and you're going to get nothing because those, those projects aren't going to get made. There's, you know, just like with this project, this project is just on the shelf right now. I mean, those publishers aren't going to see anything. So, you know. That's so, so what economics, what numbers are there? What's tangible? Like, obviously, you know, gross, domestic, gross receipts aren't, tangible viewership isn't tangible anymore what do we have i mean from my perspective you know and this is talking about changes that i think need to happen in the industry i mean from my perspective i would rather find a situation with publishers and with um recording um uh, rights where you know there aren't necessarily traditional step deals because the theatrical market is all you know 
but for Marvel movies and superheroes, you know, it's very limited. And, you know, there's art house movies, but, you know, are they going to be able to afford, you know, usually those those films are in theaters as a platform just for awards or, you know, for, for other things, right? So, um, you know, I would rather see a situation where, it's, and it would, it's like, you know, it's even the accounting issues that you'd have, to, just to make it simpler, like work on flat, you know, figure out a price that meets the economics of the movie, not the economics of what a home run could be, but just, you know, here's the type of movie this is, here's what the, you know, a, a fair price would be given your budget, whatever. And if you want to say that there's, a, you know, a bonus if it makes it to, you know, Netflix or HBO or, you know, the series of uh, what's, you know, seemingly the most successful platforms, then then have that built in with a specific number or, a, you know, a, uh, base it on a percentage of what the license was. You don't pay a 25% bonus on this license if it gets this, you know, kind of release. And at least that way, you know, you're you're putting your filmmakers in a position where they can go into the market and you're sharing in their success. You're not preventing their success. Right? Yeah. So. No, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic suggestion. And I know that's something we've been working towards. And something else too, like sometimes <clears throat> with music supervisors, there's this weird lack of transparency where we're like, oh, we, it's not MFN. And I'm like, but why not? Like, let's have all the music, you know, treated similarly if it's used semi-similarly in a documentary, especially if it's a music-centric project or based on timing or something. So then we all, so everyone's kind of in it together to be like, you know what, we're all taking this similar deal. We're all in this together. We're, you know, we want to all support each other. So it's that transparency and it's just the willingness to take, you know, to just be, to say like, everyone's in the same boat. We're but, all doing this. I mean, one reason I think the sort of model that I was suggesting works better is you can't force the transparency of a Netflix or an Amazon and they're not going to be transparent. Mm -hmm. So you might as well ride the boat of the producer and say, you know, we're going to trust that, you know, you're going to find the best home for this market because uh, for this film, because for the most part, you know, there is a sort of democratic process to, you know, independent film, good films do find good homes. And so to the extent that, you know, you're, relying on that process you will then share in the upside but you're not you're not preventing its you know place in the market and so then we have this other factor of like the sales agents who you know we can we can think this is probably going to be like a streaming thing this probably isn't going to get a huge theatrical run but then the sales agents are like no you have to have all media before I even can go out because, it, you know, we just have to have the option, even if it's going to go straight to SVOD. And and do you feel like you're ever sort of uh, stuck in between a rock and a hard place because they're insisting on rights that you're not sure are totally necessary? I'm on the side of the sales agent, maybe because I've sold films, but I've also bought films because, you know, there have been, you know, there's, history where a hundred thousand dollar movie became a hundred million dollar success. You know, I mean, you know, look at Blair Witch Project, you know, I mean, you just don't know. And, you know, if you're going to go into it, let's say you make the next Blair Witch and you go into the marketplace and somebody comes in with a huge offer, um, you know, then you have to go get the theatrical rights, you know, when the Publisher is going to see. Are you kidding me? Everyone's talking about this movie. I, of course, I'm not going to give it to you for the price I would have given it to you when your budget was ten thousand dollars. And you know, I mean, sure, the 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 person that makes the ten thousand dollar movie that you know is able to negotiate a deal at that time is probably you know going to be in a much better situation. There can be deals where there's upside shared with the publisher and the and on the recording side just because the deal allows for it. You know, so. And so it's, it sounds like you're an, in support of just getting all the rights, paying for them all, even though you are in the role of also having to find the money for that. Look, I mean, you're still in support of that. There's no, but there's times that even in those deals, right, you can, you can, you know, we've talked about step payments, meaning steps based on the success of the film, but you can also say, we're going to pay this price if it's, you know, released, um, you know, on a streaming deal or, or uh, a, a studio or whatever, however it's released. And, 
you give us an option to pay X if we release it theatrically. I mean, you can negotiate that at the same time. I mean, you know, I think the publishers are have, you know, sort of become difficult in that sense that they might say, well, we want to see how good the movie is first. It's like, well, you know, you're killing the film then because, you know, nobody's going to accept that you decide how much you get once we see how good the film is. We're taking the chance when we're making the film that it's either going to do no business or it's going to do great. So you have to sort of take that same chance too, you know, now. And yeah, the I, have a, I have a question. So Julian, let me ask a question. As far as the label mentality goes, price structuring, right? Because sometimes I'll have to, I try not to do it too often, but call the head of, you know, a division or whatever, whatever relationship with when people I don't have a relationship with who are clearing music, you know, come in with some kind of crazy high quote how arbitrary is the quoting? What is it based on? And how do you guys structure it? And how do relationships come into play? And basing like the idea, well, this is an independent film with a budget of five hundred thousand dollars a million versus a studio film. Like, how do you guys do that? And what's the thought process? Yeah, I mean, th I will say a lot of times the music supervisors I'm dealing with on independent films, they will be like, oh, we can't tell you the budget. And I'm like, well, then how do you expect me to figure out what the numbers are going to be for this song? Because I need that transparency. So usually when I get, you know, some kind of budget information and then I ask them, I go, what's the overall budget and what's your music budget? And as just on a personal level, I understand that music budgets have been slashed. And so I try to figure out, OK, based on this music budget, tell me how many songs you're clearing. Tell me what kind of songs you're clearing. Uh, just give me the full picture, as much information as you can, so then I can get creative alongside with you because maybe it's just me. I want to see these things through. I want I want this song in there. I want everyone to win. I want it to be easy and simple. I don't want to be hard about it. But I will say there are people who are just like, well, if you don't give me the information, I'm going to pull based on, well, this film kind of seems familiar to this. And, you know, well, just generally, all media rights typically, you know, based on precedence, go around X, Y, and Z. But pre precedence is no longer a thing. Deals that are, you know, films that came out six months ago are different than films that are come out now. Like, I'm not going to look in a system and base something off of five years ago. That's just a bunch of baloney nowadays. So I'm doing my best every day and trying to figure out, like, let's get creative. So, you know, you definitely things are based on relationships, but also at the same time, there are so many new projects, so many supervisors, so many new people coming in. We don't know what's going to hit and what's not, you know? So definitely. Yeah. I, have, just, well, I have one follow-up question yeah, and please. a story, actually. It's based on um, what, how often do artists have rights in the company to be able to make the call versus the label itself? And the story goes, there was a film uh, decades ago called Napoleon Dynamite, which I'd seen. I hadn't seen it Sundance. I couldn't get into it because it was a buzz film. It got sold at Sundance, had incredible buzz. And I got a call from the producer and um, he said, listen, man, there's a Backstreet Boy. We tempt the Backstreet Boys song in it. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't get festival rights. I didn't even know it was a thing. I'd never done this before. We asked for forgiveness. I'm like, yeah, OK. I said, send me the movie. I watched the movie. I was like, dude, that movie's amazing. That's going to be a hit. He says, look, we really want this Backstreet Boys song. There's a uh, Backstreet Boys song in there when I was at Jive Records where the, the bees, the bumblebees, I guess, danced to it. I forget what it was, but it's a really poignant scene. And um, so I went to Johnny Wright, who was the manager at the time. And there was like, they, they were like 25 and 25, you know, 50 grand, which is for independent film budget. It's a great budget for the Backstreet Boys who were at the top of their game. It was not a good budget and they rejected it. So, uh, he, the producer called me back and I said, do you do, what can you do to help? Is it more money? I said, yeah, I mean, with these guys, they're, you know, it, they're in a different place. They don't quite understand this world. So I, I really want to help you because this is a powerful film. It's one of the best uses of this band will ever see um, in a film. So I called my head of business affairs and I said, hey, what's the deal with why do Backstreet Boys still have approval rights over masters and he said well it's funny you mentioned that because they're asking for to renegotiate their contract and they're and they're looking for more money i said so can you renegotiate when you do that renegotiate can you try to pull out approvals so that we could basically license this song and he said well, yeah it's going to take me like two months to get that done though and i told the producer and i was like hey man 
good news, bad news. I could probably help you, but you got to wait. It's like, I don't think I can wait because the studio's on me. We're making a deal. And I was like, look, things go slower than you think sometimes because I've done this before and you haven't. Um, so if you can wait, wait, right? If you want the song, if not, move on and get another song. So at the end of the day, he waited. We got that deal done, took out their approval clause, and we were able to license that song. And I was proud of that because it's a great use. So long-winded question is, how often does that happen where you have to deal with rights holders and, and you can't make a call on your own? And what's that give and take look like for you to license? And can I add to that? Because I'm curious to where, um, you know, because you're at a major label, what is the dynamic between I have this small indie artist versus I have this giant artist versus this is what corporate wants? Love this question. <laughs> um, again, you know, I maybe I'm old school. I love a good letter from a director, a writer, a producer, or something, and I will do my best to push that through. I also, I'm not a huge fan of artists not having approval rights because they deserve to have to make that decision if they want their music against picture because, you know, maybe they aren't, they just simply are like, this is not where I see my song belonging. And just the answer is no. And money, you can, it could, I've gotten, I've done plenty of deals where I'm like, I've had some weird requests and weird things. And they're like, they write the letter, they do the this. And the artist just goes, no, thank you. And I'm like, okay, they'll double it. And they go, no, thank you. And even sometimes when artists don't have approval rights, and I personally, I, I get a little subjective and I go, you know what? I'm still going to ask you because you're a human who made this music. And just because you don't have this contractual obligation that some lawyer from God knows when said, yeah, let's strip that out. Let's take that out because you don't deserve to have the rights to say that. Like, that's your music. And labels, we're representing your music. And you know, and I am just someone who happens to come in who got this random job to do this random task and to say, you know, like, who am I to say I'm in charge of this? So I want, I'm, I'm, I'm always playing the middleman. But, you know, when it comes to an indie artist, we definitely, I'll always be like, yo, like, that you want your art, you want your music in there, you want to see this happen, you want to make this happen. Or when it's a real big artist, I will just do my absolute best to say, hey, here's the reasons. Here's some of the backstory behind it. Here's the clip. Here's what other songs are going to be doing. Here's, you know, confidentially, here's what some other artists are making on this. Like, what do you want to do? And how can I convince you? And is there anything that I can say? And if not, I respect you as the artist and that's okay. And, but that Backstreet Boys use is actually phenomenal. It's funny. I just rewatched that film the other day and I go, I mean, Jamiroquai, Backstreet Boys, there were some good uses in Napoleon Dynamite. So... But that's the thing. But, yeah, look, in that movie. case, you just never know. They, in that case, Backstreet Boys were wrong, and I was right. Like that's a movie. That <laughs> Correct I happens in. quite often. Ha that, there are moments where I, I, I'm sure I could not ever say the film or the artist, but there was a chance where I put something through, and it was a comical scene, and they were like, "Oh, this is stupid. This is lame." And then the film comes out, and it was a hit and a half, and they go, "Oh." <laughs> that's a missed opportunity right there. You just never know. So you got to go with that gut intuition thing. You got to just simply do your best. As cheesy as that sounds, that's all we can do. Do you yep. find that, and not to put you on the spot, which this might, so you can not answer it if you want. But um, we're, we're going full <laughs> transparency today. Do, I mean, when it comes to like minimum, you know, do you find that the, are there is there company policy or are there bosses or deadline bottom lines or anything that you're like, well, look, we just we can't go lower than X or how does that how does that play into it? Great story on that one. <laughs> so the long story short, um, I had a friend who worked for a very, very, very famous reality television show family. They wanted to get some service done for free. And the people who were providing the service said, sorry, my dogs don't eat exposure. <laughs> Meaning, I, you know, somebody's got to get paid here. The lawyer's got to get paid to write out the contract. The artist has to get paid for making that music. Those writers have to get paid something. There's got to be some kind of bare minimum at the end of the day. And then based on what your project is, what the budget is, all that, like, I'm going to do my best to get you the deal that makes sense, but I'm not going to undercut any creative people because they all deserve to get paid. So there's definitely some kind of minimum I keep in mind. I look a little bit in the systems. I go, okay, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I know I said I didn't play the precedent game, but you got to do a little bit of something. 
But so I just do simply my best to make it to accommodate and, you know, getting the budget, getting the understanding of what else is in it. That's all I can do. I'll just say one thing, just going back to the budget issue. I understand why you ask, mm -hmm. but I would also tell you that you would be amazed how proprietary and sometimes valuable that budget information is oh, yeah. because a filmmaker that makes a movie for a million dollars or two million dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but for an independent film that can be a lot of money. If when that film goes to market, the buyers say, oh, it's only two million dollars, we're gonna offer them 2.2, as opposed to just judging the movie on the merits and saying, what is this worth in the marketplace? And if they have that information, it really works against the filmmaker. And I, you know, you can say, well, you know, we're professionals, that information is going to get out, but you know, it's scary. And I, I think, you know, producers and, and filmmakers are very protective of that information because it does, you know, yeah. it can impact in a big way there. And also it can be used against them on some levels, even with the negotiation of the music publishing, right? Like if it's a, if, it's, if the budget seems large, but they had to pay six of seven million dollars to Britney Spears, you're going to say, well, that's a seven million dollar thing. You know, we're going to charge this, but you don't have the six million dollars, you know, or the you don't have that money to play with for your music budget. So, you know, I think there's a, a tendency to be protective about what the budget is because it's it's already usually if it's done right been thought through like here's how much we have for music and you know everybody's trying to make a great well deal just tell too, me so. both tell yeah, me both yeah. the overall and then tell me the music yeah, and i go yeah. oh i get it you yeah. guys got it <laughs> right. not a great music budget right. but let's do the best we can because right. if the pro project is cool then cool let's yeah. be a part of it right. yeah I, so I agree, both, I agree with both sides i think that you know for the producer's side if you can you have to keep that information valuable but you also have to do everything you can you have to give the music supervisor every tool you can to be able to clear that song for the budget that the producer wants to spend or needs to spend. So it's kind of, it's tough. It cuts both ways. Well, I mean, you know, trust me, and you'll know this too. If your budget's $10,000, you're, that's the first thing that's going to come out of your mouth in the conversation. This is a $10,000 movie. We only have, you know, $200 to pay for this license. You know, I understand when you use it in that perspective, but there is like a middle range where, I think on the independent side, you're trying to swing for the fences when you get to the market and you know, you, you know, anyway. I, I'm curious, can you, is, is there anything else that's sort of, that goes into a film that's affected like the music licensing is like this? I mean, like costuming doesn't really matter. No, there's, like there's, what, there's film clip clearance and you know, other clearances that, you know, are, in a lot of ways, the same types of negotiations. Um, you know, and sometimes those clips have music in them too. Um, so, you know, um, I mean, on Summer of Soul, we had a clip that um, was amazing that our archivist Lizzie McGuinn found while we were making the movie, which was Walter Cronkite on CBS News saying that he was going to cut to a reporter at the Harlem Cultural Festival to to see. Um, what the people of Harlem thought about the moon landing. And it's an amazing clip. I mean, if you didn't know that that wasn't part of our original archives, you know, um, you know, there's no way you can tell from watching the movie, but it wasn't. And it was, we had no idea that even existed. And so CBS had this policy that if something hadn't aired, that they wouldn't license it at all. And so, you know, we just kept going after them saying like, you know, finally, I think Questlove called and said, you know, do you want to be part of the erasure of history? Because, you know, there's no reason that this shouldn't be in the film. And, you know, I think they didn't want that political backlash and they, they agreed to. And do you see them struggling with the same challenges as film distribution evolves? Or is it is you know, this sort of a unique situation? I think it's easier, at least in the times I've done it, because you don't have the step deal thing. It's like this is the cost to use the clip. You know, and a lot of times they'll say, you know, we're only giving you the clip. You have to go clear any other rights that are needed in connection with that clip. And then you're really back to having to, if it's music, having to deal with the music part of it. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it's easier from that perspective. And I think it's also easier, like, you know, with the exception of really incredible pieces like that, that we found for our movie, 
you know, most times you can find an alternative clip. I mean, you can find alternative music too, but I, for some reason, I think it's like a little bit easier on the, on the, on that part of the clearance side. I mean, it's more like, you know, music is something like it has to be this music, or you know, where. Yeah, that clip Rob had a ton of power because that film pivots on that moment that you, growing up as a kid, and you assume the moon landing is like, you know, it's the greatest thing of all time, right? But yet, if you're living in these areas where people can't eat and there's, you know, so many problems in your neighborhood and they're spending billions of dollars on this far-fetched trip to the moon, um, it was powerful. And so that was great that that was able to happen. And it's it's sad that you have to send like a quest love, you have to put the quest love card out to go get that. But that's, you know, that's the, the pure uh, joy of pushing to get what you want, to get that film to be that much better because that was a huge pivot point in that film. Cool. So we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, I did want to see if anybody has any questions. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, if I understand, you know, I'm trying to remember when I used that example, but I mean, I think what I, I think what you're talking about was when I was, you're talking about in the negotiating process. The no, I'm just saying, you know, when you, when you take a film to a market at that point, the film is finished, right? And so you want to make the best deal possible. You're trying to get all your investors money back. You're trying to make as big a profit as you can. And if you have... Netflix and HBO and Apple and Amazon fighting over your movie, chances are you're, you're going to do pretty well for your investors because you're going to have a bidding war potentially, right? So my point was that in a situation where it's sort of public knowledge on a, on a smaller budgeted movie, how much you spent, it's not so much applicable in, in a bidding war situation, but where it's a little tighter, like where there's, you know, maybe one interested party or, you know, it's, you're, you're, you know, you're trying to make the best deal possible. It hurts the filmmaker if the other side knows, well, their, their investor's probably going to approve any deal that just gets them their money back. And so they're going to make an offer that, you know, is maybe just above that or maybe even just below that or whatever. So if they don't know what it costs and they think, okay, well, they don't know that the film, you know, uh, costs $3 million, they can't offer $2 million because, you know, um, the, you know, they're, they're sort of trying to get, you know, it sort of gives them the inside knowledge of what the investor might approve, assuming the investor has approval over it. So, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think in general, that is how it works. I mean, I think most independent filmmakers are very, treat the budget in a very proprietary fashion and they're not out there, you know, talking about, um, you know, with exception. I mean, all of these things have exceptions. I mean, there's sometimes somebody says, I, like I said, somebody made this movie for $10,000 and, you know, they're bragging about how little they spent on it. But for the most part, they're very protective of the cost because they don't want to give that away in the negotiation, telling the distributor, we can offer just enough that their investors are going to say, great, we made our money back. And, you know, so that's all I was trying to, trying to say. Oh, got more questions. Thank you. Um, as an aspiring music supervisor, you know, you hear things like what you said about how, you know, the worst music soup is probably somebody who's a great DJ. Not because it's not about taste, but because licensing is so much a part of it, at least 70%, like 70 to 30 or something I keep hearing. Well, it shocks me that you don't have to have like a law degree to do this, the same way that as an actor, my agent is not a lawyer. Like, I just, I'm, I'm so curious then if you are aspiring to do this, but you've come from various backgrounds. I'm, I'm 36, so I'm not just like, new at life, but I am new in this particular arena. Like, how do you start to learn this, these negotiating skills, these creative negotiating skills? Because it does feel like a crazy, like I'm like, you're talking about creative deals. John was talking about creative, you know, making creative deals with people and step and going around step deals and being creative. It's like, how do you learn that? Where's the best place to intern to learn that? Like, obviously you have to be in the field to know. So like, how do you do it, you know? I mean, John's not a lawyer yeah. and I mean, he- I Well, right, so, right. I would, I would attack that one. It's a great question, actually, because how do you learn anything, right? You learn by doing, you learn by working for someone, you learn by interning with somebody. 
And um, I learn things every day, which is crazy because at my age, like you think you know everything by now or, or not. But, you know, I was in a thing the other day where I had a really big artist that I wanted for a film and the, the label was like, I got to have this much money. Um, and the publisher was like, I got to have this much money. And then the artist was like, I got to have this much, the manager who I knew. But the, basically, they, they, I got stumped with the label and the publisher. And then I went around them and I went to the manager. And the manager said, look, man, if you can do this and take care of my guy so it's not an MFN situation and blow up my budget $70,000 because then everybody's going to have to go up, then I would do that because it's my, big, it's my artist's biggest song. And so, so I was like, okay, I'd never done one of those side deals before, right? But I was like, look, I got to get this done because it's a pre-record, right? And it was like, it was late and they hadn't given it to me until it was really late. And they basically already shot it. They shot it both ways so that if it wasn't, didn't happen, they could use this lesser track. But the point is you still learn things, right? At this, at this age. And you just have to have a, a sense of the room, a sense of the nuance, a sense of the um, the game. And also, you know, when you're dealing with Jelena and other clearance people that have a head on their shoulders and they know what they're doing, you want to respect that relationship. And if, and if you can make it work with them, that's great. But other times you just can't because of their situation, their position. You have to figure out another way to get it done. And sometimes management is, you know, a way to do it. You know, the Britney Spears movie, I'll never forget this. I did Sheryl Crow. I had a big use of Sheryl Crow in the movie. And I knew I got Sheryl Crow, her first, helped get her her first Grammy nomination ever. And so I felt a proprietary nature of this relationship. And I had a really good relationship with the manager. And the publisher was like, you got to give me this amount of money. And I was like, I don't have that amount of money. Like, this is a use. We want to use it. And so basically, I called the manager. And I got it done for the budget I have. And that clearance person who was, had a tough reputation in this business for decades didn't talk to me for a while. But I was like, I had to do what I had to do. So back to your point, I think it's just doing. You have to go in business with someone, learn from them, and, and just pick it up as you go. Right? A lot of it is nuance and a lot of it you, that nobody can teach. You just have to understand the art of negotiation. And on the other side, someone like Rob Fivlin, who's a lawyer, one of the toughest negotiators I've ever dealt with in my life. Um, and he and I go at it when we have things to do, but it always resolves amicably because we've been friends for 30 years, 40 years. So I think that's a long way away to say you just got to keep, keep pushing and keep trying. I, I would just add one little piece of that. I mean, I don't think you have to be a lawyer to be. No, I know. I know you were so, sort of saying that. Yeah. No, but I mean, any production is going to have other people in the mix that can be, you just have to look to work with them. Like if you go to a producer and say, this isn't working, can you be creative? How else can we try to do this? You know, I mean, you know, I'm not suggesting, you know, I wasn't suggesting before that the, the actual skills of knowing music and having good taste and knowing what the works in the film is important. I'm not saying that. Um, but I don't think you have to master, you know, I don't think you have to be, you know, a master um, ne negotiator or business person. But I do think you have, I do think an important part of the job is understanding the landscape and knowing, you know, really understanding what the needs of the film are and how the basics of how film finance works and how it, all the things we talked about today. So. And I would also add, just find a clearance department that's looking for an assistant or an intern. I don't know if you're looking for a full time or something, but find a label, find a publisher, find a pitching company, find a studio who's handling a lot of clearance so that you can start getting, a, you know, a, a framework for kind of where budgets fall and, and just do that for, you know, six months and you'll learn a lot. Yeah, I mean, I was a communication major. I didn't even know there was a whole music industry business behind all of this. And I learned literally everything from day one, and that was it. I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> just ask your heads friends. Up. Ask yeah. your friends or put there's a, a panel together ending. for the guild I so that you can ask people. Exactly. That's our ending. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I, every I mean, day I'm trying. <laughs> I put this panel together because I didn't know the answer, and so I wanted a bunch of people who I could talk about it with in front of a group of other people. Um, and so with that, I believe we are at our time. And so 
Thank you so much oh, to our you, amazing <laughs> panelists, <laughs> Yelena Grosinich, Robert Fivolin, and Jonathan McHugh. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.